Alice Paul Alice Stokes Paul born on January 11, 1885, died on July 9, 1977, was an American Quaker, suffragist, feminist, and women's rights activist, and one of the main leaders and strategists of the campaign for the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits sex discrimination and the right to vote. Paul initiated, and along with Lucy Burns and others, strategized events such as the women's suffrage procession and the silent sentinels, which were part of the successful campaign that resulted in the amendment's passage in 1920. Paul often suffered police brutality and other physical abuse for her activism, always responding with nonviolence and courage. She was jailed under terrible conditions in 1917 for her participation in the Silent Sentinels protest in front of the White House, as she had been several times during earlier efforts to secure the vote for women in England. After 1920, Paul spent a half century as leader of the National Women's Party, which fought for the Equal Rights Amendment, written by Paul and Crystal Eastman, to secure constitutional equality for women. She won a large degree of success with the inclusion of women as a group protected against discrimination by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 alongside legal scholar Pauli Murray. Early Work in British Women's Suffrage In 1907, after completing her master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania, Paul moved to England, where she eventually became deeply involved with the British women's suffrage movement, regularly participating in demonstrations and marches of the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU. After a conversion experience seeing Christabel Panker speak at the University of Birmingham, Paul became enamored of the movement. She first became involved by selling a suffragist magazine on street corners. This was a particularly difficult task considering the animosity towards the suffragists and opened her eyes to the abuse that women involved in the movement faced. These experiences, combined with the teachings of Professor Beatrice Webb, convinced Paul that social work and charity could not bring about the needed social changes in society, this could only be accomplished through equal legal status for women. While in London, Paul also met Lucy Burns, a fellow American activist, whilst arrested in a British police station, who would become an important ally for the duration of the suffrage fight, first in England, then in the United States. The two women quickly gained the trust of prominent WSPU members and began organizing events and campaign offices. When Emmeline Pankhurst attempted to spread the movement to Scotland, Paul and Burns accompanied her as assistants. Paul quickly gained the trust of fellow WSPU members through both her talent with visual rhetoric and her willingness to put herself in physical danger in order to increase the visibility of the suffrage movement. While at the WSPU's headquarters in Edinburgh, Paul and local suffragists made plans to protest a speech by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sir Edward Gray. For a week prior, they spoke with people on the streets to promote knowledge about why they were protesting against the cabinet member. At the meeting, after Gray discussed proposed legislation he claimed would lead to prosperity, Paul stood up and exclaimed, Well, these are very wonderful ideals, but couldn't you extend them to women? Police responded by dragging her out of the meeting and through the streets to the police station where she was arrested. As planned, this act was viewed by many as a public silencing of legitimate protest and resulted in an increase of press coverage and public sympathy. Later events involved even more risk of bodily harm. Before a political meeting at Street Andrews Hall in Glasgow in August 1909, Paul camped out on the roof of the hall so that she could address the crowd below. When she was forced by police to descend, crowds cheered her effort. Later, when Paul, Burns, and fellow suffragettes attempted to enter the event, they were beaten by police as sympathetic bystanders attempted to protect them. After Paul and her fellow protesters were taken into custody, crowds gathered outside the police station demanding the women's release. On November 9, 1909, in honor of Lord Mayor's Day, the Lord Mayor of London hosted a banquet for cabinet ministers in the city's Guild Hall. Paul planned the WSPU's response, she and Amelia Brown disguised themselves as cleaning women and entered into the building with the normal staff at 9 a.m. Once in the building, the women hid until the event started that evening. It was then that they came out of hiding and took their stand. When Prime Minister H. H. Asquith stood to speak, Brown threw her shoe through a pane of stained glass and both women yelled votes for women. 
Following this event, both women were arrested and sentenced to one month hard labor after refusing to pay fines and damages. She was imprisoned at Holloway Prison in London. Civil Disobedience and Hunger Strikes While associated with the Women's Social and Political Union, Paul was arrested seven times and imprisoned three times. It was during her time in prison that she learned the tactics of civil disobedience from Emmeline Pankhurst. Chief among these tactics was demanding to be treated as a political prisoner upon arrest. This not only sent a message about the legitimacy of the suffragists to the public but also had the potential to provide tangible benefits. In many European countries, including England, political prisoners were given a special status, they were not searched upon arrest, not housed with the rest of the prisoner population, not required to wear prison garb, and not force-fed if they engaged in hunger strikes. Though arrested suffragettes often were not afforded the status of political prisoners, this form of civil disobedience provided a lot of press for the WSPU. For example, during a London arrest, after being denied political prisoner status, Paul refused to put on prisoners' clothing. After the prison matrons were unable to forcibly undress her, they requested assistance from male guards. This shockingly improper act provided extensive press coverage for the suffrage movement. Another popular civil disobedience tactic used by the suffragettes was hunger striking. The first WSPU-related hunger strike was conducted by sculptor Marion Wallace Dunlop in June 1909. By that fall it was being widely used by WSPU members because of its effectiveness in publicizing their mistreatment and gaining quick release from prison wardens. Refusing food worked in securing an early release for Paul during her first two arrests. However, during her third prison stint, the warden ordered twice daily force feeding to keep Paul strong enough to finish out her month-long sentence. Though the prison staunchly maintained that the force feeding of prisoners was for their own benefit, Paul and other women described the process as torturous. At the end of her month in prison, Paul had developed severe gastritis. She was carried out of prison and immediately tended to by a doctor. However, after this event, her health was permanently scarred. She often developed colds and flu which would sometimes require hospitalization. Paul had been given a hunger strike medal for valor by WSPU. After the ordeal of her final London imprisonment, Paul returned to the United States in January 1910 to continue her recovery and to develop a plan for suffrage work back home. Paul's experiences in England were well publicized, and the American news media quickly began following her actions upon her return home. She drew upon the teachings of Woodbrook and her religion and quickly decided that she wanted to embrace a single goal as a testimony. The single goal she chose was the recognition of women as equal citizens. Paul re-enrolled at the University of Pennsylvania, pursuing her Ph.D. While speaking about her experiences in the British suffrage movement to Quaker audiences and starting to work towards United States suffrage on the local level. After completing her dissertation, a comprehensive overview of the history of the legal status of United States women, she began participating in National American Woman Suffrage Association, NASA, rallies, and in April 1910 was asked to speak at NASA's annual convention. After this major opportunity, Paul and Burns proposed to NASA leadership a campaign to gain a federal amendment guaranteeing the vote for women. This was wholly contrary to NASA's state-by-state -state strategy. Paul and Burns were laughed at by NASA leadership, the only exception was Jane Adams, who suggested that the women tone down their plan. As a response, Paul asked to be placed on the organization's congressional committee. Prison, Hunger Strikes, Passage of 19th Amendment In solidarity with other activists in her organization, Paul purposefully strove to receive the seven-month jail sentence that started on October 20, 1917. She began serving her time in the district jail. Whether sent to Occoquan or the district jail, the women were given no special treatment as political prisoners, and had to live in harsh conditions with poor sanitation, infested food, and dreadful facilities. In protest of the conditions at the district jail, Paul began a hunger strike. This led to her being moved to the prison psychiatric ward and being force-fed raw eggs through a feeding tube. Seems almost unthinkable now, doesn't it? Paul told an interviewer from American Heritage when asked about the forced feeding. 
It was shocking that a government of men could look with such extreme contempt on a movement that was asking nothing except such a simple little thing as the right to vote. On November 14, 1917, the suffragists who were imprisoned at Occoquan endured brutality allegedly endorsed by prison authorities which became known as the Night of Terror. The National Women's Party, NWP, went to court to protest the treatment of the women such as Lucy Burns, Dora Lewis, and Alice Kosu, her cellmate in Occoquan prison, who suffered a heart attack at seeing Dora's condition. The women were later moved to the district jail where Paul languished. Despite the brutality that she experienced and witnessed, Paul remained undaunted, and on November 27th and 28th all the suffragists were released from prison. Within two months Wilson announced there would be a bill on women's right to vote. Paul had an active social life until she moved to Washington in late 1912. She enjoyed close relationships with women and befriended and occasionally dated men. Paul did not preserve private correspondence for the most part, so few details about her personal life are available. Once Paul devoted herself to winning the vote for women, she placed the suffrage effort first in her life. Nevertheless, Elsie Hill and Dora Kelly Lewis, two women whom she met early in her work for NASA, remained close to her all their lives. She knew William Parker, a scholar she met at the University of Pennsylvania for several years, he may have tendered a marriage proposal in 1917. A more thorough discussion of Paul's familial relations and friendships is found in J.D. Zonizer's biography. Paul became a vegetarian around the time of the suffrage campaign. Alice Paul's Grave Site In 1974, Paul suffered a stroke and was placed in a nursing home under the guardianship of her nephew, who depleted her estate. News of her penniless state reached friends, and Paul was quickly aided by a fund for indigent Quakers. Paul died at the age of 92 on July 9, 1977, at the Greenleaf Extension Home, a Quaker facility in Moorestown, New Jersey, less than a mile from her birthplace and childhood home at Paulsdale. She is buried at Westfield Friends Burial Ground, Cinnaminson, New Jersey, U.S. People frequently leave notes at her tombstone to thank her for her lifelong work on behalf of women's rights. Paul was posthumously inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1979 and into the New Jersey Hall of Fame in 2010. Her alma mater, Swarthmore College, named a dormitory Alice Paul Residence Hall in her honor. Montclair State University in New Jersey has also named a dormitory, Alice Paul Hall, in her honor. On April 12, 2016, President Barack Obama designated Sewell Belmont House as the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument, named for Alice Paul and Alva Belmont. The University of Pennsylvania, her doctoral alma mater, maintains the Alice Paul Center for Research on Gender, Sexuality, and Women. Two countries have honored her by issuing a postage stamp, Great Britain in 1981 and the United States in 1995. The U.S. Stamp was the 78 cents Great Amur Eakin series stamp. Paul appeared on a United States half ounce $10 gold coin in 2012, as part of the first spouse gold coin series. A provision in the presidential $1 coin program directs that presidential spouses be honored. As President Chester A. Arthur was a widower, Paul is shown representing Arthur's era. The U.S. Treasury Department announced in 2016 that an image of Paul will appear on the back of a newly designed $10 bill along with Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the 1913 woman suffrage procession that Paul initiated and organized. Designs for the new $5, $10, and $20 bills will be unveiled in 2020 in conjunction with the 100th anniversary of American women winning the right to vote via the 19th Amendment. In 1987, a group of New Jersey women raised the money to purchase Paul's papers when they came up for auction so that an archive could be established. Her papers and memorabilia are now held by the Schlesinger Library at Harvard University and the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. in 1990, the same group, now the Alice Paul Institute, purchased the brick farmhouse, Paulsdale, in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, where Paul was born. Paulsdale is a national historic landmark and is on the New Jersey and National Registers of Historic Places. The Alice Paul Institute keeps her legacy alive with educational exhibits about her life, accomplishments and advocacy for gender equality. 
Hilary Swank played Paul in the 2004 movie Iron Jawed Angels, which portrayed the 1910 women's suffrage movement for passage of the 19th Amendment. In 2018, Alice Paul was a central character in an episode of Timeless, Season 2, Episode 7 which alludes to Paul giving an impassioned speech to President Woodrow Wilson during a march that ends in police violence upon the suffragist marchers. According to history, Paul was at the event and was arrested, but there is no evidence that she spoke to Wilson on that day. In 2022, Suffs, a musical written by Shina Taub, premiered at the Public Theater with Alice Paul as a main character. On January 11, 2016, Google Doodle commemorated her 131st birthday. Thanks for watching Herdery Channel. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe our channel.